Hello, welcome to the fourth of a series of tutorials for PRISMS PF, an open source phase field modeling framework developed at the PRISM Center of the University of Michigan. In this video, I will show you how to set up and run a simulation for domain coarsening following spinodal decomposition. Specifically, we will simulate the evolution of an unstable homogeneous phase as it phase separates into two stable phases forming domains that coarsen in time. Before I begin, I should mention that for the sake of saving time, I will skip some of the details on how to compile and run the code. So before you watch this video, I encourage you to watch our first two Prisons PF tutorial videos. For this tutorial, we will create a new application starting from the nucleation and growth application. Then I will go through setting the model parameters as well as the initial conditions and the boundary conditions. I will quickly go over the results visualization. And finally, I will use some of the recently available post-processing scripts to analyze the results. Again, I will include a set of useful links and resources in the description of the video. Okay, we are going to start with some basic background on spinodal decomposition. Then we will present the model and governing equations we will use, which are essentially the same as for nucleation and growth. So in order to go over the details of this model, please check out the nucleation and growth tutorial, because today I'm going to skip those details. After that, I will go through the things we need to modify in the nucleation and growth application to simulate spinodal decomposition. These changes are mostly straightforward, with the exception of the initial conditions, which will require defining a random variable to simulate a small initial perturbation of the composition due to thermal noise. And finally, we will again use visit to see the results. And in addition, we will do some post-processing analysis of the output using the new post-processing scripts for PRISMS PF. Okay, let's start with a brief overview of spinodal decomposition. Spinodal decomposition is observed when an initially stable phase is quenched into a state in which it is thermodynamically unstable. Quench means an abrupt change in conditions, for example, a sudden decrease in temperature. The energy curve shown here is for the state after the quench. In the nucleation and growth video, we talked about the region marked in green, which is the metastable region. But for a system to undergo spinodal decomposition, it should have a concentration within the red region, which is the unstable region. As you can see, a homogeneous phase with a rescale concentration, phi naught, is in a higher energy state than stable phases with either compositions phi alpha and phi beta. So a homogeneous system with a concentration phi naught can spontaneously reduce its energy by decomposing into two phases, as long as the total composition of the system isn't changed. In order to observe this in a facial simulation, we need to start from a homogeneous phase and then add a small perturbation in the form of noise. What we typically see is the evolution of the system shown in the bottom sequence of images, where the blue and red domains have compositions phi alpha and phi beta respectively. Okay, for the phase field model, we can construct the exact same free energy that we have presented for the nucleation and growth example. This energy has a double well contribution and a gradient contribution. And here are the governing equations. We need to use the can Hillier dynamics because of mass conservation. For example, since phi represents the rescale concentration of a species, the total amount of these species should stay constant as the system evolves if there are no sources or sinks. For convenience, we can split the can Hilliard equation into coupled equations for two fields, phi and mu, so that we do not have to calculate a fourth order derivative. And for Prism's PF, we will need to discretize the equations in time using the forward Euler scheme. Finally, here are the equations in the wake form. 
And here are the terms we need to input into Prisons PF. Again, we've covered this in the nucleation growth video, so I'm just um, skimming through it. Okay, we are almost ready to start with the implementation. But first we need to specify the field variables and constant values that will go into the model. Like we did previously, uh, I will use C to denote rescale concentration. And in the table below, we see the list of all constant values that the model will need, as well as the names that we will use in the code for these constants. We are going to use the exact same values for all the variables in the nucleation and growth example, except for the average concentration, which we will set to 0.5. That is right in the middle of the spinodal region. Also, we do not need to define any constants pertaining to the nucleus. Instead, we will define a new variable for the amplitude of the initial noise term. For this, we choose a small value compared to the whole range encompassed by the equilibrium concentrations, which is between 0 and 1. Moving on to initial conditions, instead of inserting a nucleus, we are going to set the initial value of C to a constant value. This is the average composition plus a random noise term, which is within an interval given by twice the amplitude A, which we defined in the previous slide. And now we're going to use preactive boundary conditions instead of no flux or natural to minimize finite size effects. Finally, we have the simulation parameters, system size, mesh, etc., which we are not going to change. Okay, let's go to the implementation. The first thing we're going to do is copy the code and parameters files from the nucleation and growth example into a new application folder called spinodal decomposition. Out of these files, we only need to modify custom PDE.h, the parameters file, and ICs and BCs. We are going to leave the equations and post-processing files intact because we are using the same free energy and dynamics as the nucleation and growth example. Let's start with parameters. Again, we will use this one, parameters adaptive. But before we go into editing, I am going to rename this file and change the extension to .prm because this extension is required by the latest versions of DL2. Okay. Let's open the files. The first thing we will change is the bounds for the adaptivity criteria. Since the stable phases in a free energy have concentrations 0 and 1, we want to tell the adaptive method to refine the mesh for values in between, but not including the bounds, which will hopefully encompass most of the interface. So let's choose 0 0.01 as the lower bound and 0 0.99 as the upper bound. Now let's go and change the number of time steps. 50,000 will give us a decent representation of the evolution dynamics. Next we change the boundary conditions from natural to periodic for both fields. We go to the constant section and change the average composition from 0 0.025 to 0 0.05. Since we're not going to insert any nucleus, we remove the initial nucleus composition and the nucleus radius. And the last thing we need to do in this file is add a constant parameter for the amplitude of the noise that we're going to add to the average concentration in the initial conditions. Since we changed some of the constants in the parameters file, let's go to custom PDE.h next and define these as variables that we will read from the user inputs. We remove CN and R0, and also we don't need delta, and we add IC amplitude. Okay, one thing we will have to do here is declare the random variable used in the initial condition and initialize it using a seed. But before we do any of this, we need to include the random library as a header. Now let's specify two type defs for existing C++ classes that we will need. We'll do this in the public section. 
The first one we will call engine, and it is for a class to generate random numbers. You can Google this if you want to know more about this specific generator. And the second one we will call dist, and it is for a class needed to generate a uniform real distribution of double type numbers. Next, we will declare instances of these two types in the private section that we will initialize and use in the code. We choose the names RNG of type engine and distribution of type dist. Now we will need to initialize this distribution with a seed and a convenient way of doing this is in the custom PDE constructor, which will be called each time an object of this class is created. So let's write this here. First, we define a seed based on the system clock. Then let's define the range for the distribution. And finally, we initialize the random number generator with the seed. So every time a method calls this generator, it will return the next entry of the sequence. Okay, we are done here. Now let's go to the initial conditions file. And this is going to be very simple. For the variable index zero, which is the concentration, we will remove everything and simply define it as the average plus a random number between minus one and plus one. And this is what this term here does. And this initial conditions function will be called for each point of the mesh, and each time it will pick a different random number. And for the other variable, which is mu, um, which has the index one, we don't need to do anything. Okay, that is all we need to change. Let's save, compile, and run. I'm going to skip this step because we've shown this before. And once we have this results, we are going to plot them. And this is how the evolution looks. As you can see, small domains start to appear and as time progresses, the domains coarsen and take the bulk value of either zero, the blue regions, or one, the red regions. Notice that at least by eye, it looks like the proportion of red to blue faces is constant throughout the simulation, which is what we would expect if the value for each face is fixed and the dynamics are conserved. Now I would like to show you some of the information that you can extract from the results other than pretty pictures. First, we're going to analyze an output directly calculated by Prisons PF in the file postprocess.cc, which is this file, integratedfields.txt. This file contains the total free energy of the system as a function of simulation time, and it is calculated as the space integral of the local free energy. I have created a simple Python script to open, read, and plot this free energy. And here is the plot. The most straightforward consistency test for a phase field simulation is to ensure that the total free energy is decreasing over time, which is what we see here. If for any time interval, the total free energy increases, that means there is something wrong with either the dynamics or the calculation of the free energy. Now I would like to showcase the post-processing scripts that we released recently which use the visit CLI to perform some simple data analysis directly on the .vtu files that Prisons PF outputs. These scripts are in the directory post-processing scripts. So to use them, let's copy them into our application folder. Um, as a parenthesis for some basic instructions on how to install and use the visit CLI, please refer to this page on the GitHub. We have three post-processing scripts, but we will continually be adding more. Let's go through each of them. So domain count calculates the number of independent domains in the system. This means the number of regions of a single phase that are not connected in space. 
and it will output this result for the simulation times corresponding to the .vtu files. Before we run it, we just need to change the variable to analyze from the default, which is n, to the rescaled concentration in our simulations, which is c. Now, the way this is set up is to count all the regions where the value of the field is higher than 0.5. So in this case, it'll count the red regions, but you can easily modify this to count the blue regions. And once we do that, we can run it with this command in the terminal, visit-cli-s, name of the file. And when this is done, it'll create a text file with three columns, the index, the time, and the number of domains. You can just plot this using whatever tool you prefer, and this is how it looks. As expected, with coarsening, you have fewer domains as the simulation time progresses. Let's move on to our next script, phase fraction. This script simply will calculate the volume of one of the phases and divide it by the total volume, or the same, but with area in the 2D case. Again, before running it, Let's not forget to change the variable name to C. And once more, by default, it'll give us the fraction of red face, but we can easily change that to the fraction of blue face if we wanted that. Again, we run it using this comment on the terminal. And the plot for the face fraction is this one, which is very boring, but that's a good thing because we do not expect the proportion of each phase to change with time. Now let's go to the final script, interface area. And as the name indicates, this script calculates the total area of the interface between two phases in a 3D system, or equivalently, the total length of the interface in a 2D system. For this, I'm just going to show you the plot. And again, this is expected because as domains coarsen, the total interface area between the faces is reduced. One last thing I want to show is a nice result we can obtain from this interface length measurement. A known feature of coarsening following spinodal decomposition is that the characteristic length of the system increases with time following this power law. And one way to calculate the characteristic domain size in a 2D system is taking the size of the system, which is a constant, and then divide it by the total interface length, which is what we just calculated. And if we just plot this versus time, we get the black solid line. By the way, the length scale of the axis is logarithmic. And then we can compare it to the form that includes the t to the one third power times a constant that I just found by fitting. That is the blue dashed line. What is important here is that the slopes of the curve are approximately the same, which confirms that the domains are coarsening with the expected dynamics. And that is yet another source of confirmation that the simulation results are consistent with the model. So with that, uh, we will conclude this tutorial today and as always, don't forget that in the description of the video, we posted a link to the user's manual, the GitHub repository, and also a link to register for the user's forum, where you can submit your questions about the use of Prisms PF. Thank you for watching.